are listening to the Human Care Podcast, part of the Invisible Not Broken Podcast Network. I'm your host, Eva Minkoff. This podcast features conversations with health entrepreneurs, care professionals, patient advocates, and industry change makers. What do they all have in common? The mission to humanize healthcare. In every episode, we offer unique stories paired with education, actionable tips, tricks, and takeaways, all to help you better navigate healthcare and transform it into human care. So today I'm live with Dr. Veronique Mead, former practicing physician and assistant professor of family medicine, now somatic trauma therapist. For the past 20 years, Veronique has been integrating the science and her personal journey of gradual recovery from disabling chronic fatigue syndrome into a new model for making sense of chronic illness of all kinds. Her research explains how effects of trauma are not psychological, as is often mistakenly believed. Veronique shares the model and science she never learned in her medical training on her blog, Chronic Illness Trauma Studies. So thank you very much for creating such a resource for people like myself, others listening, and well, allies alike, right? Yeah. Not just for us. It's for people taking care of us, people who love us. Which they can be pretty busy. They can have a lot to do when we're at our worst. Yeah, that that's for sure. It's, I feel like a lot of the time we talk about what's going on with us as patients and the burden that we bear and not as often on those that are working with us, I would say, with us. And that's worth acknowledging, especially when it comes to these resources, people like you are cultivating. It's, it's important that we all invest our time and efforts into those resources. So thanks for creating one. (laughs) My pleasure. I thought it'd be great to create something where we didn't have to wait for our healthcare professionals to kind of add it into their own training or knowledge base. Yes. (laughs) It's uh, integrating anything into the medical system or even like med school system. That is not easy. Not easy, my friends. (laughs) It's a goal of mine one day as well. But anyway, I digress. I would love for you to share your story with us in whatever way that you'd like to tell it about yourself personally with chronic illness as a physician, now a somatic trauma specialist and how that led to creating this resource, the chronic illness trauma studies. Okay. I will start with the onset I've had chronic fatigue syndrome, also known to some as ME or ME-CFS for about 20 years. And at my worst, I was pretty much bedridden for almost a year. I had trouble sitting up for more than five minutes at a time without starting to feel worse. And for some people with chronic fatigue syndrome, it happens very suddenly often the ones that start very suddenly it happens after something like an infection or it could be a traumatic event like the loss of a loved one or surgery or an accident but for me i'm one of what it appears there are about 40 percent of us who have a gradual onset and my onset was very slow i got a little bit worse every year for about 10 years and The very first hint when I think all the way back was being in between seeing two patients who were both high risk in obstetrics patients during my work. And I remember having a moment to sit in between the two and my head felt really heavy, like so heavy, I actually had to like lean forward and hold my chin up. And we do that all the time, but when I think of it, that was the moment when I first felt something odd. And over the next few years, I would have what I came to call fatigue attacks. I'd be fine, and then one day I would just be slogging through my day 
and I would actually be so tired that it would be effortful to roll over in bed at night. That's how tired I would feel. And then a day or two later, I'd be back to normal and fine. And so that actually happened over years and they were far enough apart, maybe months apart, I don't remember now, but that I'd completely forget about it. I'd wonder what it was at the time and then it would happen and I'd kind of wonder with no idea what was going on. And I was in medicine as it was starting to get worse. I was teaching residents and medical students and having a full on practice in a residency training program. And it was getting to the point where sometimes I would choose to be on call in the hospital for the whole 36 hours or 24 hours instead of going home. And, you know, going home and sleeping in your own bed when there may be quiet nights is a real resource. But it was easier. It was starting to get easier to stay uh, at the hospital sometimes on call. And what happened were a couple things happened at the same time. One is I, I developed low back pain, which ended up going on for about six years. No idea what triggered it, but it was hard to sit or stand or walk. And I would supervise residents while laying on the floor in the back room where we talked with them about what they're, they were trying to figure out. And I would have the keyboard on my lap and be on the ground horizontal because I couldn't sit or stand long enough. And part of the process of working with the low back pain led me to eventually work with a therapist who was really outside of a traditional way of working. And our sessions were an hour and a half long, which, you know, if you're a doctor and there's never enough time and sessions are really often squeezed. And so there's never time to really listen to patients and people as you'd really like to. It was amazing. And he listened in a way that was really profound. I felt seen and heard in a way that I don't know if I'd ever felt before. And one of the things that Kevin, my therapist, introduced me to was this concept of beginning to listen to myself and my impulses and my body. And that kind of changed my whole track. I was starting to feel depression. I'd had that before in my life. And I, I'll talk about this later. But it was an indicator potentially of something in the same direction of the chronic fatigue that I would eventually develop when I started being able to see it from a different lens. And the depression, when I started listening to that, I ended up realizing that I actually didn't feel right in my medical career here I'd landed my dream job. I was a drive away from my family, my parents to visit. I had bought my first beautiful house. I was starting to settle down and I was feeling this sense of despair and meaninglessness. And as I learned how to listen to that process and trust it and actually trust that there was something intelligent to it rather than something I needed to suppress or fix or or get rid of, I ended up making these set of decisions and leaving medicine, which was a pretty big thing after you know, all the years of training that you do. And I was also, my, my fatigue was worsening and I kind of thought, you know, I, I tested a few things that, a, that we might check in medicine. Fatigue is, is one of the most common things that we see and we, can't always figure out what it is. And there are some real common things like anemia or having thyroid problems. I even checked my blood sugars, just very basic things to make sure I wasn't missing something obvious. Everything was normal. And so I, I kind of had a process over the next 10 years where I did not go to medicine as things got worse. I did not consult physicians or healthcare professionals very much because I was really curious about what was going on in my body and whether there was any intelligence that I might need to listen to here as well. So I started off with taking a year off and I thought stress reduction, 
you know, the, the enormity of the stress that I had as a doctor with no time, no time to myself, not really a life, I thought it would clear up. And instead I got worse to the point where then I was starting to feel the fatigue more as it was beginning to happen more as a baseline. So I could go for a hike, but I'd poop out before I got back to the car. And that's kind of how it gradually proceeded over the years. Eventually I learned that if I overdid it and went too far and did too much of a hike years later, I could then pay a, a penalty for three weeks. And that's a big thing in chronic fatigue is learning that we actually can't push through it. And a lot of us have been workaholics or type A's or super high achievers before. And so pushing through is something we've learned how to do and can do really well. And that was a big lesson. And along the way, as I kept listening, I ended up, after my year off, I ended up having this thought one morning that I wanted to do work more like what Kevin had done with me, which was really about listening to the body. And I was curious, could I learn to listen to symptoms? Was there a way I could work differently with all this? And I ended up finding a program and retrained as a somatic trauma therapist and got a master's degree in learning how to listen to the body. And the process, what I started to learn in at Naropa was, I went to Naropa University here in Boulder, Colorado. And what I, one of the first things I learned was that trauma was so different from what I had ever thought. As a physician, pretty much what I ever thought I knew about trauma was it's the big stuff veterans who serve in the military. It's linked to post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. It's really something that psychiatrists deal with and it has nothing to do with me other than the acute care stuff. If someone's in an accident, there's physical trauma and they need emergency care. And as a family doctor, that wasn't something that I particularly specialized in. So it had never seemed relevant to me, but I was, writing a paper one day and I was looking for an example to highlight how trauma might work with maybe physical symptoms. And the what I learned about trauma is this definition is that trauma is anything that is overwhelming to the point where you, your system can't actually adapt or overcome it. So it's much more subtle than we think about and it's much more common. So if you're a child and your parents get divorced, that can actually change your whole life. And it can actually be traumatic because at, so, at, a, at some level as a child, our whole existence is actually dependent on our parents. We, we can't survive on our own. And so the younger we are, the smaller the event has to be to actually sort of stimulate a, an unconscious perception of life threat. The other big thing I learned and that I've been learning since Naropa in the past 20 years is that the effects of trauma are not psychological. And here in the chronic illness community, people who have been told it's all in their heads, that they're weak or lazy or faking it or trying to get attention, all those things, it's not that. And, and when, when I mentioned the concept of trauma to folks with chronic illness, that's a really common reaction is anger and that I'm, that's what I'm saying. So I just want to be really clear while I'm talking out here that this is not what I'm saying. We're learning that trauma actually alters how our nervous systems function, how our genes function and turn on and on, to on and off through the process of epigenetics where molecules attached to the genes change how they function. And there are all kinds of things we're learning about this. And so this had, was getting my curiosity back in 2000. I was writing the paper. The concept is that in this program that I was in is that what trauma also does is it interrupts something that your system's actually trying to do. 
So it might be that it's interrupting fight or flight. You know, you're trying to protect yourself or defend yourself in an accident or speaking up to someone who's being abusive verbally or in any other way. And when we can't actually overcome an experience in that way, this is the proverbial bear in the woods. If you're not strong enough or fast enough, what your system does is it freezes, it shuts down, it goes into a place that can have brain fog and everything can slow down. And that interrupts whatever you were in the middle of doing. So if your body was gearing up or in full fight flight mode and you had your system went into freeze, it can happen very suddenly, it's not conscious, it's actually the, the defense response of last resort, then what gets interrupted can actually initiate this pathway, a survival pathway that gets stuck and thinks even days, weeks, years later that you're still in that event, you're still caught in that event. And so writing this paper, I wondered, what if in the middle of a traumatic event, instead of the emotions that we think of as PTSD, what if it's your blood pressure that was rising to help you meet what needed what you needed to do? What if that got interrupted and stuck? Could that lead to or contribute to high blood pressure? Or what if when we're mobilizing, when we're jogging or running or going into defense, our body will actually release more sugar or make sugar more available because that's the fuel for our muscles. What if that got interrupted and got stuck sort of in that pathway where your blood sugar levels stayed elevated or were in a pathway that would eventually become stuck and elevated? Maybe that could be what diabetes looks like. And so these were pretty far out there thoughts that I had back then. And so the question I had was, is there any research at all that's already been done that supports the possibility that trauma could be a risk factor for any chronic illness? And I've been finding over the past 20 years, I have like 12,000 articles at this point in my database and I can't keep up. There is so much information, but it's actually in silos. It's in one researching group in type 1 diabetes that doesn't talk to a researching group with lupus, that doesn't talk with folks looking at epigenetics and how early trauma alters the nervous system. And so there are all these groups finding these things, but that aren't talking together because this is not a way we think about things yet. What that ended up leading to for my own chronic illness journey was wondering whether trauma could have played a role in my own fatigue that was increasing. I was still able to go to school, but I didn't do a whole lot of physical activity. And so one of the first things I looked at was, is there, like, like um, a veteran who has a trigger response when they hear a car backfire, for example, maybe they'll have a big startle response or break into a sweat or their heart rate will start pounding. That's a well-known response to a reminder of a past traumatic event. It's a trigger. And so I wondered whether my fatigue attacks would ever get triggered. Were they ever triggered by something that might be identifiable as opposed to coming out of the blue? And it took me a year of watching really closely. And one day I noticed that I was in the middle of worse fatigue and realized that I'd just been on a phone call with someone where there'd been some conflict. That subtle, that simple. And that fatigue attack only lasted a few hours and then it was gone. But then I noticed one, I had an exacerbation, a flare up of my fatigue at one point for 10 days. And Often, you know, in the first few days, I didn't know if it was really my fatigue or if it's just that I'd overdone it. I didn't know, could there have been a trigger? And so I rested, laid on the couch. I spent a whole lot of time on the couch, just sort of waiting it for it to pass, like it tended to do. And five, six, eight days in, it was still going on. And I was still trying to figure out, was there a trigger eight days ago? And one day the idea popped into my head, 
the same thing had happened. I'd been on the phone call with a friend of mine and we'd had a conversation around a home birth she'd gone to to help. And she'd had her own kids. She was a healthcare professional, but not trained in obstetrics. And there had been some problems and a close call during that delivery. And then everything had worked out fine but once I actually thought about that phone call, within two hours, my 10 day fatigue attack was gone. It was, yeah, I'm seeing you kind of not shaking your head. You know, it was kind of mind blowing to notice that. And so these were through personal experience, some of the first ways I started to wonder, could my own increasing fatigue be linked to a nervous system pattern that might have gotten stuck in some kind of threat response. And just trying to figure out what parts of the story to share next, because I really, again, I, I figured doctors aren't going to be able to figure this out. I knew that I very likely had chronic fatigue based on my symptoms and what I was finding on the internet. There's no test for it. There's no way to really know for sure. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. I had, I didn't really have other symptoms that seemed to fit for other things. So my own doctor's mind was very helpful here. But I, I think part of why I didn't go to a doctor separate from really wanting to listen to the intelligence in my own system was a knowledge of how little we know as doctors. And how little is as concrete or as clear or as easy to diagnose as we think. In our culture, doctors are on such a pedestal. Medicine is really discussed as having the answers. And that's really not what it's like for many, many, many symptoms and illnesses and people, which is what your whole show is really about, is all the people that are getting missed by our system. And so there came a point where I, I graduated from my, my training and then I specialized in trauma because of everything I'd learned. And my fatigue just kept marching along and getting a little bit worse all the time. And at this, by this point, it had become much more clear to me that I really thought that's what was going on. And I was doing trauma therapies, working from a perspective that works with the nervous system to shift these old pathways that still think, that still perceive threat, that still think they're caught in the past. And I was getting worse, but I've wondered since that that might have slowed my worsening. 10 years is a really long time to just keep getting worse and worse and worse. But I was seeing clients and then it was getting harder to see, spend time with clients. I would see, I was having trouble by the end seeing 10 people a week. That's 10 to 14 hours of sessions a week, which is not a ton. I had some uh, clients, I was specializing in chronic illness from these perspectives and some of my clients who had their own really difficult chronic illnesses, part of as a somatic trauma therapist, what you're tracking is you're tracking what's happening in your body. You're using it as a tool in a way to note what's going on for the client and you're working from, again, a nervous system perspective to kind of track, okay, is their system going into more fight flight? Is their system speeding up or getting caught? How do we sort of listen to this and then find the nuance of how to unwind or resolve what might be causing their system to be kind of out of whack? But as this process would happen, I would feel their fatigue or their not necessarily theirs, but I would, it would, it would create a sort of a resonance in my own system. And I would be so exhausted during sessions that it was really difficult to stay vertical. And I would rest horizontal on my bed in between sessions. I would rest when I took my shower first thing in the morning, I'd go lay in bed for a while. It got harder and harder. And out of the blue, I got a call from my new agent for my disability insurance that I've been paying for for 10 years. 
and he'd been assigned when I moved to this Boulder area 10 years before. And for some reason, he called me one April out of the blue and said, I just want to introduce myself. How are you doing? And I told him about my fatigue and I, I talked to people who'd said, don't apply for disability. It will be on your record forever. And you don't want that. And when, and, and how are you even going to get diagnosed with this kind of chronic illness? But I had a, I actually, he was so supportive and curious. He said, you really should apply given how much I was struggling. It took me three tries which is really common with disability. But I got my disability a very good plan from when I was a doctor. And within a week of when the money came in, my whole system just crashed. It's that's where I realized how much I had had to push through for years to just survive and see my clients. And I didn't do anything else outside of seeing clients. I'd been really struggling. And that's about when I, I had my worst period for about nine months. But the money was really super helpful. It actually made a huge difference. I was able to start adding more approaches and therapies to working. I'd had to go see a doctor to get the disability insurance. We'd done more lab tests. Everything had come back negative. No surprise. That was really what I thought. It kind of confirmed what I thought. Yeah, you just kind of <laughs> threw your arms up it's like of course right <laughs> and that's so common with chronic fatigue too is that most of the time you're you have no positive labs I had one positive one and it was an antibody test an ANA an anti-nuclear antibody and it's so common it's so ubiquitous that it doesn't mean anything and I would track it over the years and it actually would go up and sometimes it would go down and I never knew that about antibodies. I had always thought antibodies, uh, for example, type one diabetes is the autoimmune form of diabetes. And the antibodies are part of what they suspect attack and destroy insulin producing cells. But in the research I've been exploring in type one diabetes, I discovered that the the antibodies can form 10, 12, 15 years before the onset of type 1 diabetes. The, the ones who are at higher risk, it, it often starts in childhood, are the ones who develop more than one kind of antibody. Often it's two or three kinds of different antibodies. And they're the ones whose antibodies increase and increase and increase. And then at some point, it shifts and they develop type one. But there was also research showing that for some, the antibodies arise and then they go down and disappear. And those looked like the folks who did not develop type one diabetes. So that was totally new information for my little medical mind, you know, and way of thinking. So I kind of followed the ANAs. I saw a chronic fatigue fibromyalgia specialist. None of her tests came back uh, positive for anything either. And they had proposals for things that they could try. There were IV things. There were detoxification processes. There were all kinds of medications. I learned from an infectious doctor specialist in the local community of another medication that was a trial run. And as I kept listening to my own system, I just didn't want to try to remove the symptom or try to make it go away. It wasn't because I wanted to be sick, but I was by then I was really starting to think that my chronic fatigue represented a nervous system that was caught in a state of freeze. Mm -hmm. It was caught in a state like hibernation. It's like a bear that can't come out of hibernation everything has shut down and it's actually an intelligent attempt to wait out the threat. And what I was learning, I was starting to look at, so what's my trauma history? If this, if I think this is a trauma response and that my system is actually stuck in freeze, what's my trauma history that might have put me into this and might have led me to develop this chronic illness? And it took forever for me to figure it out. I do not have a history of abuse, not physical, emotional, 
or sexual abuse. My parents, there, there's a, okay, so I'm gonna talk about one of the studies here known as adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. or ACEs that look at 10 particular kinds of trauma before our 18th birthday. And they found that you add up the number of these 10, how many of these 10 you've been exposed to. And if you've experienced even two of them, you actually have a 70% chance of ever being hospitalized for an autoimmune disease. Oh, wow. Yeah, two of these. So the ACEs include abuse, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. They also include emotional or physical neglect. But they also include losing a parent for them getting divorced or separated, having a parent with a mental illness, having a parent who struggles with substance abuse, maybe they're an alcoholic, mm -hmm. having someone in the family, in the household who's ever been jailed, or the last one, number 10, being a witness to domestic violence between your parents. Those are the 10 ACEs. And I read that article that, that was published in 1998, around the time when I was in medicine, never heard of it. And none of the illnesses that they talked about as it being as ACEs were a risk factor for diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, cancer, and chronic lung disease. But none of those were chronic fatigue. And none of the things they mentioned were autoimmune diseases. And so I didn't know what to do with that information. And I also didn't feel like I'd experienced any of those ACEs. So my ACE score was zero, essentially. And but but I also started to look at other things that might have contributed. And we can talk about that some more, maybe afterwards. But essentially they were little things and the the big piece I ended up figuring out was I did have an A score of two. My, my mom talking to her a few years ago had postpartum depression for two years after I was born. And I don't even think about postpartum depression as a mental illness, but she told me she'd never cried so much as she did during the first two years after I was born. And part of this was that she had moved to another country with my dad when she was pregnant with me. So she'd left her whole support system behind. And she had gotten to this new city and it was so ugly. <laughs> she would cried, you know, when she first saw it, poor thing. But then during my labor, she'd been given an epidural at the very end and had developed a spinal headache as a result. So she couldn't even lift her head up off the pillow. And this is actually a kind, all of these are kinds of adversities, they're prenatal stress. And there's a whole other body of research that I've been finding over the past 20 years that indicates how prenatal stress is actually a risk factor for chronic illness later in life, also for mental health conditions. Again, not because it's psychological, but because it actually affects how our nervous system develops and how it orients to a sense of safety or a sense that there's a lot of threat out there in the world. So that that was one little thing. And the, the other ace for me, I, I've only really recently acknowledged this, is a sense of emotional neglect. It's something we don't really think about. If I think about emotional neglect, I think about the worst. You know, parents who are completely absent, uh, completely unavailable, their kids are locked up in a closet or in their rooms. There's no interaction. They don't feel seen or heard. And really it's the subtle end of this that I, it took me so long to recognize in my own life because what we grow up in is what we know. And it think we, we tend to think that's what's normal. Mm -hmm. And on my end, it's really about my parents from their own histories, not having a whole lot of range for emotional connection. And I've found that this is really common for a lot of us. We might be, we might have survived our childhoods by being the fixer in the family or the helper or the pleaser or the caretaker. You know, my mom would confide in me her struggles with my dad and her loneliness throughout my childhood. And there's a term for that, but it's it in, a, in essence is really not the direction the relationship should be when you're growing up. 
So that's just a couple of tiny examples of what I discovered, but those were my two aces. And then there were these babyhood events that were also contributors potentially. And then during my very slow onset, the a lot of folks have all kinds of stressors in the years before the onset of chronic illness. And for me, my medical training, you mentioned when we were talking before we put this on record, how ballet was traumatizing for you and it's not for others. My medical training was really traumatizing for me. That's understandable. Uh, yeah, you would think it's understandable. <laughs> yeah, the the hundred hour work weeks, but it's also about the amount of trauma that you witness, the amount of suffering, the sense of helplessness because of the so many things you actually can't help, the deaths that you witness. All of those things I began to see as risk factors. And that one first moment between two women who are pregnant with high risk pregnancies, both of my parents have histories from their own births that are quite traumatic. And we're learning about multi-generational effects of this, but also witnessing what we do and what I had to do to help women during labor and birth. I really felt I was causing trauma. I just had no idea that's what it was at the time. Mm. So just to fast forward through it all, this clarity for me and working with it from a trauma nervous system perspective to shift my body's unconscious perceptions of threat have been my biggest tool and over the past 10 years i've climbed out of that grand canyon where i was mostly bedridden having the support and the funds to see healthcare professionals i work with acupuncture and um, homeopathy and ayurveda and like most people i've tried many, many, many things. But for me, this trauma perspective has been the most helpful. And I'm not completely out of the woods, but my days look really quite normal. I can do errands and I exercise an hour a day. I take walks every day. So there's a lot of things in my life that is, have really normalized, even as I'm working and chipping away at these last bits with my health. Well. First of all, congratulations on that alone. Because, uh, Thank you. It's big, isn't it? It's, it's really, really big. I know we just say, just rolls off the tongue. Like, yeah, like I can do these things now. And, and, or, oh, I only went through 10 years of agony and, or fatigue where I could barely do anything. It just like, it comes out as words. But they're so loaded. It's so loaded. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a huge deal that you can have normalcy in your life. And be it's huge, huge, massive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm even thinking about for me, I finally got, I think the proper diagnosis six months ago oh. after 20 years of having wow. pain. And Is this with EDS? Yeah, with EDS. Yeah. So I was, di I, my first diagnosis was about 10 years into me having pain, which was fibromyalgia and then hypermobility syndrome. And still things didn't make sense. And honestly, I still think I have diagnoses ahead of me possibly, but Ehlers-Danlos syndrome really made sense. And there were, have been 10 years in between this diagnosis and my first diagnosis. So it's been, it's been a journey for sure with me. Going back to your, to I'd say the pivotal, the pivotal mindset shift that or approach to your care. I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. So for people who are interested in exploring trauma in their lives and also defining what trauma means in their lives, like how, how they go from there to opening up and, and healing, like, what does that healing journey look like in a bit more detail? I think that's the ultimate question you know, once and if you start to think about things as potentially linking to a trauma perspective, then what? Mm -hmm. And I, I think of it as I have 11 tools that I think about. And some of these are tools that actually support your body's own capacity to heal, because all of our bodies actually know how to heal. And it's how do we provide enough support so that they're not having to work as hard in this potentially this threat response sense of lack of safety how do we provide enough support 
that maybe that'd be enough for our bodies to gain that margin so they can heal. And those are the things that are very commonly talked about as mind body practices or lifestyle practices. And I used to think these were kind of, oh yeah, so what big hairy deal. <laughs> But they actually are working with our physiology. So these are things like when we talk about eating, it's not just eating clean or getting rid of the, the sugars or the junk food. I ended up spending, an, as part of this journey, four and a half years on a very, very clean diet. For me, it was GAPS, the gut and psychology syndrome diet, who was developed by a doctor. I actually don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. The GAPS diet? The or GAPS diet. It's very similar to the audio, autoimmune paleo diet. Mm -hmm. Everyone finds a different, there are so many out there, I can't even keep track, but they're all helping eliminate something that might be triggering for your system. Right. And so for me, part of my own illness, because we tend to have more than one thing, I had uh, 10 years of worsening food intolerances. Fun. Oh, fun. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah, but, I couldn't tolerate carbs. So it started off with desserts. And then over the years, it was also vinegary foods. I love uh, salad dressings and vinegar things with a sharp bite. Mm. And then it became potatoes. And then it was carrots. And, and I would notice this because I was tracking things very closely at this time. And it would give me symptoms like restless legs, dry mouth, dry eyes, things that you might even think were Sjogren's disease. Mm. So. I ended up going on the gaps where I cut out all carbs and it was meat and vegetables and broth okay. and juicing. That's what I did for two and a half years. And I, it calmed all my symptoms down. I also had IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which yeah, really common across the board for a lot of us. For me, it was severe constipation. I name it because there'll be a lot of listeners I suspect who might be able to relate and that's also something I saw as a freeze response, just it was a symptom in my gut. So after two and a half years of this, everything had calmed down and then I started losing weight. And I got to a point where I was starting to look chronically ill. So I'd lost too much weight and I realized that I wasn't absorbing very well. So I then switched to another diet, another way of eating because I realized that even vegetables have carbs who would have thought they are carbs technically <laughs> right <laughs> glucose oh uh, so i did zero carb this is Whoa. meat only for two more years Whoa. yeah oh it was hard but you know there's nothing like symptoms to motivate you right so this very very clean diet i didn't i cheated less than 10 times in four and a half years you know with an apple <laughs> once because there was no fruit on the zero carb diet so I did this and again everything calmed down and with zero carb my energy levels actually improved a bit but it, but it didn't cure anything and I was still working things from the trauma perspective so diet is one exercise is another and I as someone with chronic fatigue exercise is the worst thing you can actually do and from a trauma perspective Mobilizing, exercising, being active, actually, from how I see it with my own experiences, it's actually stimulating. You're trying to do something that elicits that fight flight, mobilizing, mm. sympathetic nervous system activity. And if you have a body that's caught in freeze because nothing else has worked in the past, then I see it as you may actually be stimulating more freeze in your system, more shutting down, more suppressing energy levels because it's seen by your unconscious nervous system as another form of threat to your survival. You know, if you are a small animal being chased by a cougar, if you can hide out in a cave and be very still and very quiet and hardly breathe at all, it might completely lose track, run right by you, and you might survive. And this is what opossums do. It's their actual threat response. And their physiology actually changes. Their blood pressure and heart rate go down. They're actually not faking it. Their whole system is shifting. Mm 
But if you were to make that little rabbit in the cave or that opossum try to move, that can actually stimulate the predator to attack. Predators, coyotes, cougars, lions, they need movement to stimulate the attack. So it's actually a threat if you're visible. Wow. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. I just have such a hard time wrapping my head around mobilizing or like even taking away the word exercising, but just intentional movement as a bad thing. I understand the degree to which one does that being varied. Like there's a spectrum based on what's going on. But usually my very general response with people with chronic illness is, and I again, I, this is a general response is, it's important to find ways to quote unquote exercise, but it's very different for everyone. And you need to, based on your condition and the, the speed at which you accelerate something, the types of movements that you do, but the idea of it being bad, you know, straightforward, just a bad thing for you is really like, that's very mind boggling to me. It's hard for me to understand. It is. And I, I think of it even not as it's a it's a trigger that can make things worse but i one of my alternative healthcare pr practitioners was the first one who suggested this and he said don't do it for exercise do it for oxygenation oh. and that helped shift my mindset and what you just named was another really important piece which is doing it in small doses to see what your system can tolerate so when he told me to do that that was the year I was mostly bedridden. And I said, okay, he knows more than I do. I'll walk around the block. Just, just that, just walk around the block. And it took me three days to recover from that. It made my fatigue that much worse. But because of the perspective I had and that he had been really helpful for other things with me, I decided, okay, that was a too big of a dose. I will try smaller. And he had said 30 minutes a day, but it could be there. It's not about speed or distance. Mm -hmm. And you could do 10 minutes three times a day. And I know there are lots of folks with chronic fatigue who actually start with one minute of doing something, moving something while they're in bed. Mm -hmm. So this concept is also called titration. This concept of working by wow. dose of what works for you is actually really big in trauma work. What's that? that your move? When I hear the word titration, I go back to my lab days <laughs> when I worked in the lab and Oh, <laughs> yes, with a pipette. Yes, yes. Yes. So you put one drop in at a time. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So this is a huge principle in working with trauma because mm -hmm. our systems go into these places because they've been overwhelmed in the past. And it doesn't take much to cross the threshold from being fine to suddenly being overwhelmed as a trauma response. That's what our systems do. Mm -hmm. So uh, diet and exercise, people talk about it all the time, but going in this extreme way with how clean, I think of it as eating clean and how you approach something like activity, I then applied that to everything. I did try supplements and vitamins and my body would have a reaction to those. And I looked at it from the same principle. If your body has symptoms, because your nervous system is caught in a threat response, trying to keep you alive. A really intelligent thing is trying to do. Unfortunately, you have symptoms, but fortunately it's kept you alive from this past trauma, but it's gotten stuck in that new set point and you've gotten stuck often for decades, like you and I. If you take something, a medication to try to remove that symptom, for some people, it's a miracle and it's a cure and it makes all the difference. And for some of us, it actually, again, like the exercise, can trigger symptoms getting worse or clamping down even more. And that's what I found would happen for me. It would make my, my body would have diarrhea or an explosion of belly pain or my fatigue would be worse. So... The other things in that 11 tools, we won't go through all of them, but they're things like a mindfulness practice where you actually look at and work with and practice being with yourself as you are and your symptoms as you are without judging, with compassion and with curiosity. 
and that's part of how I discovered my first triggers was by really paying attention and not thinking about my body as broken, but thinking about it as responding intelligently to what's going on in the world. Other things include something that's resourcing in your life. Resources are, like you mentioned, ballet for you. Is there a way that ballet can be a resource without you actually having to do ballet? For example, is there some way you can experience joy or comfort or satisfaction or pleasure? Whatever it is, it's different for all of us. But what that does is it conveys, it can convey a sense of safety to your nervous system because it's a very different state than these other states of fight, flight, stress, anxiety, freeze. And so as we begin, we can start adding tools to our toolkit. And I did all of these different things and I also incorporated trauma therapies. Trauma therapies for working specifically with emotional neglect, attachment trauma, that's what that's known when that relationship with our parents, it's very, very common, you know, that it's not ideal, that maybe they love you, my parents love me, but with their own stuff, it makes them hard, made them really hard to be there fully available. I had no one really to go to as a kid when I was distressed because there wasn't really a lot of room for that. And so what do we do when our system as a child can't get the support it needs to regulate distress or move through distress? Over time, that can really lead to a system that cuts ourselves off from the neck down, goes numb, pushes through, and just kind of goes about life. We move on. But these things tend to catch up with our, our physiology. And so the trauma therapies are another place that people can go to. And I recommend therapies that are specific, therapists who are specifically trained and knowledgeable about trauma, that they are trauma informed, mm -hmm. that they've done some kind of training. And the more training they've done, you know, three hours versus three years or more, it can it, sort of the more capacity they will often have to work with it. And also, if they do their own work, I've been doing this work. It made a huge difference in how I worked with clients. And then you can see it and understand it more as well. So those are some of that first, you know, that first round of what I'd recommend. But it's also can be learning more about trauma. There's a lot of books um, that really explain it in a compassionate way. There are other resources, documentaries that incorporate the trauma view, even if they don't talk about chronic illness per se. So you were talking about ACE, right? That's ACEs, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second because Absolutely. Uh, it's a little in line with my experience. I feel like essentially everyone has been in a way traumatized, right? We want to use that word. So the, ooh, I forgot how many options there are, but you need at least two of aces, right? I don't remember how many there are. <laughs> it doesn't matter. There are 10 and the more aces you have, the more chance you have of developing some kind of effects of trauma. Right. And most of those, like you said, it wasn't very obvious that you had any of them. And then you dug deeper and it was clear that you had two, but I, I see trauma as, and I'm definitely not a trauma expert. I just want to put that out there. I've always seen trauma as it's just a per your perception of something. So it doesn't matter what if, right, you, you alluded to what I said earlier, I, I have been traumatized by my 15 years of pre-professional ballet training and someone else in my class who did everything I did didn't necessarily find it traumatizing. So at the end of the day, it's while there are certain things that traumatize people more often, like the ACEs that are mentioned, it's just really whatever your body decided to harbor as, as trauma and it manifests thereafter. So for instance, when I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which now even after 10 years, it, it is clear that fibromyalgia was a proper diagnosis. Maybe there are other things, but fibro is definitely one of them after years of that diagnostic process being developed, it's still clear. But anyway, I was diagnosed by a, a neurologist, again, after 10 years of no one giving me any answers. 
And during that session, I did not, I didn't know what fibromyalgia was. He didn't even give me a heads up before he mentioned it, but he's doing a normal evaluation. Can't remember the details of what that was initially, but all of a sudden he just stopped, took a step back, looked at me and said, did you have a traumatic childhood? I was 20 years old. Right. And, and I was like, no, I actually had a fantastic childhood. Sure. I got complaints here and there, but I felt really loved. I was I'm very lucky in a lot of ways. And he, he just, he just kept standing there looking puzzled. And he said, are you sure? <laughs> and I was like, I, I doctor, I, I, I don't think I have any trauma. Like I'm digging. I don't think there's anything I'm suppressing. And he goes, okay. Is there anything in your life where you experienced chronic, like long-term stress, physical, mental, emotional? And I was like, uh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh the, me being a ballet dancer for 15 years. Yeah, maybe, maybe that possibly could relate. And he's like, yeah, that. <laughs> and Look, I don't, I didn't ask enough at the time because I didn't know what he was talking about, right? But I wish at the time I'd asked, like, tell me more about why you're asking. Because he explained he, that people with fibromyalgia, almost always from what he can tell, have a history of trauma, but trauma is defined in so many different ways. I wish I had asked him further, like, what else is going on that makes you think that I have fibro? Are you just saying it's like, oh, well, it's some sort of psychosomatic condition, which we can talk about that word. <laughs> because, like it's unexplained. And so you must be traumatized and you're feeling all this pain. So I, I didn't, I never, I don't even remember this doctor's name, but he was on to something. He was definitely on to something. And so anyway, I just like to challenge this idea around what constitutes trauma and therefore it being related to autoimmune disease, because I think we've all been traumatized which sounds dramatic, but it's just, I think we've all experienced trauma It's and it's to different extents and from different triggers. But if we say 70% like this correlation, which I, I totally believe in every way because of how our bodies react to trauma, like the, the body connection as we've been talking about, but it's also like, well, you could say that the 70% of people with autoimmune diseases were traumatized because most humans are traumatized. I don't know. You get where I'm, I don't even know what my, yep. is. it's just more, <laughs> that's, yep. that's, that's where my thoughts go on this topic. I think this is a really important question. I'm just getting a little cool. So I'm putting my jacket on. There's a bunch of thoughts on this. We, we tend to think that I don't know if you ever saw the movie Boyhood about 10 years ago. No. It, it followed a, a family, a, a actors that, that act like a family for, I don't know if it was 10 years or 15 years. It was a long period of time that they would drop in, do some filming, come back, drop in. And in essence, in that movie, they portrayed Mason, the boy, as in the end, coming out really healthy and well and having overcome parental divorce, domestic violence between the parents, and a lot of challenges of maybe psychological abuse because of what he witnessed, but also the threat the, par the parents had, the dads had towards the kids. And that in the end, it was kind of portrayed that he'd made it, he was going to college, everything was good. He was 20. The thing that we don't think about is that just because those things are common doesn't mean that they have no impact on us. And the same thing with what you're saying about trauma, just because it's common doesn't mean they have no impact. And one of the things I think about is 50% of people in the US have a chronic illness. Yeah. 50%. And in any given year, 20% of people have a mental health condition of some kind, like depression or anxiety, that's very significant. I mean, so the effects of trauma 
we tend to think of mental health conditions as related to trauma. So that's one effect of trauma. But addictions are actually understood in the world of science of trauma as being a response to trying to cope with overwhelming feelings that are the result of trauma that is unresolved. Hmm. We have a, an epidemic of addictions, yeah. right? And so that's another effect of trauma. Another effect of trauma is having more challenges in our relationships, often because what trauma does is it fragments us. We sort of have to cut off some parts of ourselves in order to let the other parts survive. So maybe we cut off our joy, or maybe we cut off any anger because there, it's not there's no room to be anger in our family system, or maybe it's dangerous, or maybe sticking up for yourself actually leads you to being more attacked physically or verbally by your parents. And so maybe you have to cut off your anger. And so we start, the more pieces and parts of ourselves that get cut off, and this is not conscious, it's not psychological, it's actually a unconscious nervous system survival response, the more it affects our capacity to function fully as adults. And so if we grew up in a family where we didn't feel seen or heard or believed, and there was no soft landing place when we were distressed, it can actually make it really difficult to be in relationships as an adult, in intimate relationships, in long-term relationships, or we may choose the same environment we grew up in. So people who grew up in domestic violence situations may choose partners completely unconsciously that are really nice in the beginning and then turn out to be abusive themselves. So difficulty with relationships is another effect of trauma. So when we start to think about how many effects of trauma there are, it's everywhere. It's yeah. everywhere. And chronic illness is just one of those effects that some of us develop that others don't. So does that respond to your question at all? Because I think there were some other thoughts I had, but I wonder how that lands as a first oh, pass. That makes sense. Yeah, because we were attributing it to autoimmune disease, but it, it contributes to, I mean, a, the plethora of different other uh, yes. consequences. Heart disease, type two diabetes, larger bodies, having a larger body, liver disease, cancer, relationships i mean what's um, that absolutely relationships of all sorts yeah uh, and and uh, i'd say first and foremost relationships to ourselves first and foremost exactly i was cut off from myself that's something i've learned i got married in the middle of all this i mean i met my husband before i was at my worst and he proposed to me when i was mostly bedridden Aww. i mean I know. How's that for counteracting what we think of you having to be perfect, right? And then I, we waited and got married a year or two later, but. Yeah, I actually, it's funny. I had, I, for the first time ever since I've been with my husband, which has been five and a half years now. Yeah, five and a half years. Oh, Congratulations. Last week, five and a half years. So I don't know why I randomly decided to ask him last night if you had known uh, at the time we started dating what being with me would have been like in regard to my illness, because now I've been diagnosed with EDS, my pain is a lot worse. He knew I had fibro about four dates in, I think, and almost broke up with me. Like he actually has told me since that he almost didn't because he, long story short, has like a survivor thing where he, he used to date women where he had to save them in some capacity yeah. like so he, yeah. he thought about leaving would not seeing me after that because he didn't want to have to take care of someone else but then we went dancing for five hours and he's like <laughs> hey, she's kind of awesome <laughs> <laughs> exactly she might have chronic pain but apparently she can go out dancing so i'm happy anyway flash forward now five and a half years so i asked him in all honesty if you had known what this was going to look like five years later would you have continued dating me and if you said no, I would completely understand. I'm just curious if this is what you were trying to avoid. And he said, if I knew everything that I knew now at that moment, I still would have dated you. 
I was pretty shocked, actually. I was not expecting that. Oh, I've got goosebumps, actually. It was really sweet. Oh, it's it's so, so sweet. Bullshit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> FOS. <laughs> he's like, yeah. He's like, no, really. Like I, I, in some ways I always knew that this was possible and, and I'm still here and I still would have been then too. Like, oh, oh, I've got more goosebumps. <laughs> it was nice. Yeah. Oh. And he's also a, a doctor. I don't know if you know that anyone, oh, anyone mentioned- listens to human care, they know, cause I somehow bring it up every freaking episode. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it just ends up being relevant somehow. <laughs> but yeah. So uh, it's understandable if a doctor doesn't want to come home and take care of people more. We haven't even had kids yet. Oh God. <laughs> we don't have kids. We both met for the, in later in life. I was in my forties. None of us, neither of us had been married before. Neither of us had kids. And it's been plenty of work just working through this process that is really about relationship for both of us it affects both of us how we've worked through it and and the part of my husband David that is a caretaker also and that has had to really work at his own self-care to not throw himself under the bus and that's actually a pattern his own survival pattern that kind of fits hand in glove with my pattern of at some level needing to be taken care of, which I needed to get more conscious of and work with because I grew up, it was like independent, independent, do everything on your own. But there are all these different aspects of us that we work with as we work to heal the trauma. Working in our relationship is part of how I and we have both been healing from our own adversity too. Yeah. And like I said, everybody's got their stuff, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Different different versions. Yeah. How else have has uh, trauma affected your relationships? I have a big response to shame. There's a lot of shame in my family system with one parent regularly shaming the other throughout my childhood. And that's kind of an example of a very subtle end of the spectrum. It's not domestic violence, but the amount of tension in the relationship with our parents is something that kids pick up on. And and so part of my own shame response means that I will freeze or won't speak up or won't defend myself or I, I recently had an event with a cyberbully, you know, someone, I posted something on another website and they were really quite shaming in their comment. And I could actually watch it from all the work I've been doing over the years. My immediate response to that comment was I had a huge spike in heart rate. My heart started pounding. I got weak and shaky in my limbs, kind of like a big fat adrenaline response but I didn't go into a fatigue attack, which is what probably would have happened five, eight, 10 years ago. And so instead what was mobilizing was a fight response, but also, I mean, it it kind of freaked me out. I could really feel that vulnerability, but with everything I've learned, I worked with that relationship differently. I kind of caught my breath, acknowledged that that person was being pretty hostile noted that I was still safe and I didn't have to respond in a hostile way. And it, I ended up after making some responses to address what their underlying concern was, realizing, oh, and I have a friend I could call who I can learn more about the topic they're presenting that I don't know much about. So I actually went outside my normal response to think I have to do this by myself no one can help me and actually expanded my awareness. This seems really obvious to folks, but if you have a system that's had to do it alone, so that was progress. So that's maybe an example of how I might work in a relationship. It's an extreme one with a total stranger, 
Now that that actually resonates with me a lot. So thank you. Mm. So there's there's so many different directions we can go and we do have to wrap up, but I'd love to finish with, I asked you before this, if you had a giant billboard with anything on it, like what you would, a message you would want to share with the world, credit to Tim Ferriss, because that's his question and I love it. Uh. <laughs> and, I, and I really liked yours, would, would you share it with us? Yeah, it comes from a neurologist who learned about trauma late in his career and then became a specialist in this. His name's Robert Scare. And the, the phrase, the quote is, if you've got a chronic illness and you're wondering how to open your mind about what might be going on, it's, it's a nervous system issue, not a tissue issue. And it's a way of thinking that it might not be the missing enzyme or the altered a chemical balance or the adrenal fatigue, quote unquote, it might actually be your nervous system doing something on purpose to lower your thyroid levels or increase your cortisol levels as an intelligent way to help you try to survive something that's otherwise difficult. So thinking about it on the nervous system perspective. Yeah. Which affects, it. If it's affected by and affects everything. everything. Just like we were saying, trauma manifests in like count, it seems like countless, countless ways, right? Ways. Yeah. And for me personally, I feel like that takes some of the pressure off the, the shame and blame around yeah. trauma. It's like, no, it's, it's kind of everywhere. We all experience it in some capacity, minor, major, um, it, it affects all of our bodies. So it's, it's kind of scary. You could look at it through one lens be like, oh my, that's very overwhelming and scary and a lot. And what do I do about it? And then also like trauma, that word in my eyes elicits a response of unique, not, not, not in a good way, but unique, like it's more than normal, right? Like there's your body's responding to, responding to something that this is not normal. It is more than I can handle. Yeah. But ironically, it's normal to have that. Yes. It's, it's sort of a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Spot on. Yep. There we go, folks. <laughs> That's a good note to end on. Well, thank you so much for joining today. Very informative and uh, I don't know, calming. Somehow this, this talk was really calming for me. Oh, I am so yeah. glad to hear that. Yeah. Thanks, Eva. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. The Human Care Podcast is part of the Invisible Not Broken Podcast Network, a network that includes several chronic illness, disability, and health-related podcasts, including Explicitly Sick, hosted by Monica Michelle, Discomfort Zone, hosted by Jason Herderick, and of course, the original Invisible Not Broken podcast. We absolutely love feedback. Love, 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 love feedback. And connecting with you one on one or within our Invisible Not Broken podcast community. So please reach out to us anytime. We're open to topics, critique, you name it. This is a podcast created by us for you. You can find information about all of our network podcasts, community, and how to contact us all on invisiblenotbroken.com. You can also find us on social media platforms through the handle Invisible Not Broken and Human Care underscore podcast. That's it, everyone. Thanks for listening and being a part of our mission to transform healthcare into human care.